Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and welcome back to part four of the Woodworker's Vice build. Now be sure and watch the first three parts. Let's get started. Now what I'm going to show you today is optional, and it is an addition that my buddy Ted made to the patterns, and that is this boss here that allows us to make a little pocket in there for a dog. Now the original print does not show that. As you can see here, that's the front jaw. So when he made these up, he just went ahead and made this extra boss. And I went ahead and, in the uh, extra piece here, milled that out. And that's what it will look like. This is the prototype vise that Ted made up in Wisconsin, and here it is. Notice also that he put two slides in there, slide rods. I only made one. So he did make several improvements or modifications. Also notice he's got the wooden jaws in there. That will be part of this video also. But there you can see a little possibly knurl nut or screw and a slot that will allow you to raise and lower the dog in that little pocket. When I made my castings, I put this little plug in here that Ted provided, and I just put a piece of scotch tape over it, and you can see the remnants of that, the little depression there, even the tape got picked up by the sand. But what Ted made here was several other parts that I did not use. I'm not sure I fully understand everything that he did here, but this is a little core box, and he even sent a sand core kind of rough sand that he used. It looks like it was, I think he said for salt in a water softener or something like that. Very coarse sand bordering on being gravel. No offense, Ted. But that allowed him to get nice square corners. Using an end mill, I'm going to have round corners, which I do not particularly like, but I will have to make I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the little dog itself will be made something like this. I'll be cutting it out of here and rounding the corners to fit in there. That'll be a little bit labor intensive. On my sample here, I'm going to use a 3 8 cutter end mill and make it 7 8 long. I'm going to try to get it right in the center. Now I think that there could be a tendency for this to break out when you use the dog and tighten it up against work. That is, break out here. So I believe I'll move the slot, not move it, I'll <laughs> lay it out on the other one, a little bit closer to this side, about where the pencil mark is right now. Also, somebody told me that sand tends to get packed, it's not sand, sawdust gets packed down into there. So I put a little drain hole for sawdust. I don't know if it'll work. I'm not going to do that in the other one because I kind of hacked this up, you know, and it ended up off-center and just looks unsightly and amateur. So I'm going to abandon that fiasco. So let me lay this out now on the other one. Okay, that's what it looks like. And I will mill it down to a depth of almost all the way through. You can see a little bit of a line there and a center line. What I'll do is start with a 5 16 end mill and rough mill most of it out and then I'll finish with a 3 8 end mill. Why am I doing that? So that the drill, the milling cutter does not deflect because I'll be milling rather deep. Also it's very hard to get the chips out of there and the chips end up almost as dust because they are getting cut and recut over and over until it's almost powder. So I'll have to blow them out there or use the vacuum cleaner, but they it's just a, a deep blind pocket milling is what it is. Let's go over to the mill. I'll show you how I'm going to set that up. Here's the setup. There's an angle plate back here in case you can't see it. And I've squared the work up real well. And I'll put two more C-clamps on here. Well, you can see how deep I want to mill there. There is no uh, digital readout on the Z-axis. And I'm going to do all my feeding with the knee. So what I've done here is I put my uh, indicator onto the table. It's held on there with the Noga. And watch the needle now, because I'm not going to show this while I'm actually milling. I'm just showing you the setup for that. 
So when it comes up to the zero, I will be at my full depth. And I'll have to reset that when I change mills. I have a 5 16 end mill in the collet right now, and I will finish with the 3 8 as I said before. Get your glasses on, let the fun begin, and I'm going to be watching the digital readout as well as the layout lines. Again, this is just rough cut. The actual dimensions will be achieved with the second end mill. Well, there it is to that point. Now I'll go ahead and change the end mill to the 3 8 and repeat. Here I go with the finishing pass. Now I can feed a lot deeper now because I'm only taking a 30 second off of each side. 80% of the material has already been removed. I've reset the dial indicator. I've reset the digital readout. I'm, I'm watching both of those. I'm making progress, but this is a lot of extra work that Ted put me through. As you can see, the pocket is this deep. So now I need to make the dog, and this is 3 8 hot roll, and about a week ago I did this, just thinking about how I was going to do it, because I thought it would be awful nice to mill that if I had a concave milling cutter for my horizontal mill, but I did not, but you might have watched recently, oh, let's see, Keith Rucker, as he did an edge like that. That's the ideal way, but I'm going to just use an abrasive machine, and it won't be easy. But using a 3 16 radius gauge, you can see I pretty well got it there. And I don't care if it's just a little bit sloppy in here. But now I'm going to cut it off to length. Can you see the line there? Barely. Also, it's a little bit longer than what I need right now. I'll trim that later. You notice that I do everything later? And later never comes. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can tell I'm getting a little wacky here, you know. Been working all day, but I, I laid out the radius on there, so you get an idea of what I'm going to do here. So let me go cut that off, and I'll be right back. Okay, that's how I'm holding it in a machinist clamp with the narrow jaws. Let's me get in a little bit closer than any other way. It'll get too hot to touch, and I want to keep keep it on there square. So I'll grind a little bit, then I'll check it with the gauge and so on, and I'll just worry it away, and it's going to take a long time, so I'll just show you a little bit of this. I made it good and loose so I don't have to fight it. So there it is. I have to cut it off the length. Still about 3 eighths too long. And I gotta somehow fasten it in there, but I thought maybe of just using a roll pin to go up and down, but I'm gonna use this screw that I happen to find in my junk drawer. It is it has a shoulder on it and it's one quarter fine. So I will also then cut a slot a little bit over a quarter so that'll slide up and down and that can be locked in any position.
You know what I just discovered, fool that I was, this screw is too short. Fortunately, rummaging through that box, I found its brother. But it's too long. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll chop it off. But first, I will mark the dog and uh, transfer punch it, drill and tap it, quarter 28. In getting ready to drill that hole, I just had a little thought here, and I'm analyzing. I have often recommended that you own two, three, four, or five drill presses. I own five myself, because that way you can just move from one to the other for countersinking and counterboring and so on. But it does absolutely no good, because every one is piled with junk and becomes unusable. I might as well only have one and put another shelf right here. That's a number four drill bit. Well, there it is. I hope that doesn't look too large and out of proportion. I mean the diameter of the knob. So, I'll go out to the garage and saw that off on that line, sand it a little bit, and that part is done. And you know what? Did you just hear something? Maybe not. Someone has just called me from upstairs, and you know who it is? Alex Trebek. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. All right, it's the next day. I'm up bright and early, and the first thing I'm going to do is get ready to paint it. Yes, I'm going to actually paint it. But before I do, I'll prime it, and then I'm going to use this Rust-Oleum Gray, whatever it's called. Pewter Gray is what it is. I filled this hole with Bondo and I have to wait for that to harden and sand that a little bit and then it's ready right away to prime. Did you know that they fill an awful lot of holes and imperfections in castings on machinery? For instance, if you strip a bridge port down to the bare minimum, you're going to find that they did a lot of filling and that's why they usually have such a beautiful surface finish on them. Especially hardened machines were made, you know, it's just nicer than a Cadillac, but uh, they did filling to get that finish over the cast iron. So, next time you see this, it'll be in gray primer, and I'll probably show that to you then before I put the finish on. This will take a little longer to dry. Then I have to make wooden jaw plates and assemble the thing, and then it's about done. Okay, here's all the parts just about ready to assemble, and the finished coat of paint is on there. And I, these are still warm. I just baked these for 30 minutes in my wife's oven at 200 degrees to kind of harden up that paint. It was still just a little bit sticky. So I think they look pretty good. Now the next thing I want to do is to lay out and cut the wooden faces for the jaws. Okay, I searched my shop from one end to the other looking for some one half inch thick maple. Well, I didn't even have any three quarter thick. So I am settling at least temporarily with this piece of hardboard, which is three eighths thick. I can't go to the store because we are being held prisoners in our home because of the pandemic and uh, they violated the Bill of Rights. So I'm stuck here with this. This might just be temporary, but it's going to go on just like that. It already happened to be the right width, believe it or not. So I just have to cut it to the right length and fasten it on there, and I'm basically done. I woke up this morning, that's three hours ago, with a traumatic nightmare. We had lost Henry at the airport, and this is going to go to him. I think you will remember that the countersunk holes will uh, be used with much longer screws than this to hold it to the workbench, but the other two tapped holes here are going to be flathead quarter 20 machine screws which will fasten the plate onto the casting. So I'm just going to transfer those and then drill them and countersink them to fasten this on. That's already been cut to length. I wanted just a little reveal right here.
Okay, that's looking good, and I'm just reminded of how much I hate working with this hardboard. Drilling and so on, the burrs and everything are, you know, it's just not a good material for... This is an old drawer bottom or something. Or, or no, actually it must be a piece of paneling or something. Well, it's time for a little assembly. Remember I had witness marks here, so I will drive that pin in. 530 seconds pin. I put a drop of oil on it and I'll just hammer away. Remember I had some relief on there so it shouldn't be too bad. I had to ream the paint out of the holes and actually that's easier to do than to fiddle around masking them. I could stick some paper or steel wool or something in there too while I paint but that's the way I went today. Alright, there's the alignment. Then I will go ahead and drive in this 532nd tension pin, spring pin, roll pin at my leisure because it's probably going to be a little bit of a struggle. I got to put this on an anvil to drive it in there with my Tubal Cane Vaughn hammer. But before I pound that pin in, I've now got the other draw plate in there, pretty well evened up here, evened up here, and I'll take it over and saw it off, and then I'm going to sand it down so that it's pretty close to being exactly the same length as, as well as I can do by eye. If you do not own a set of transfer punches, put them on your Christmas list. You may enjoy them even more than you would the old spice gift set. So there it is, pretty well matched up. And we'll do the final transferring here. I drill those holes all the way through and you know I really do not, look at the burr you got. I really do not know what size to drill for this because wood screws just do not work very well in particle board. You know, they staple the stuff together in cheap furniture and uh, trailer drawers and things like that. But uh, there's no place for the wood to go, the material to go, when you drive the screw in. So it kind of swells up like you have your cheeks puffed out. Now I'll give it a try. It isn't really that critical when you think this is, is just a woodworking vise for Henry. Just about done. Now I will truly drive that roll pin in there off camera. The last step in assembly is the dog. No big deal. I did make the screw for some reason quite a bit longer than the slide bar. I'm not sure if that was in the dimensions. Uh, of the blueprint or just something I did. It could be sawed off but I'm just going to leave it as is because I'm essentially done. It moves very slow, uh, easily, no binding whatsoever. Of course it would be better with an Acme thread. I do not own an Acme tap. And those wooden Particle board jaw faces are certainly good enough for Henry for a start anyway. Now looking at the drawing, of course the workbench is represented by the red lines. So it's screwed up into the workbench from the bottom and this screw through the casting. Let this big old block of wood represent your workbench, which is two and a quarter inch thick, but of course you're not going to have a bench that thick. So generally it's shimmed with whatever thickness of board to make up that thickness of two and a quarter, 
and then the vise goes on there like this so it's about flush right here and then there would be holes here for other dogs you know what it looks like on a woodworking bench and then this dog can be raised and lowered and a large piece of work clamped between this dog and the dog that's in the bench shop. Most of you had wood shop and understand that. And so it goes. We started with a plan in a project book. Ted in Wisconsin, and thank you Ted, made the 3D prints. I made the castings in my foundry which you watched in uh, part one at the end of part one of this video and here is the finished project probably about two hours worth of video altogether but considerably longer than that to film it as you can imagine this little corner bench vise for woodworking may be the subject of a future video depends on if there was any interest in the video that you're watching now well there it is the completed project it took me four days hope you enjoyed the video series remember I have well over a thousand other shop videos of various kinds that you may be interested in please subscribe give me a thumbs up if I deserve it a thumbs down if I deserve that so I'll see you in the next video so long for now.